Chapter 8 The Pulpit I had not been seated very long, ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered. Immediately as the storm pelted door flew back upon emitting him, a quick, regardful eyeing of him by all the congregation, sufficiently attested that this fine old man was the chaplain. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalesmen, among whom he was a very great favorite. He had been a sailor and a harpooner in his youth, but for many years past had dedicated his life to the ministry. At the time I now write of, Father Mapper was in the hardy winter of a healthy old age, that sort of old age which seems merging into a second flowering youth. For among all the fissures of his wrinkles, there shone a certain mild gleams of a newly developed bloom, the spring verdure peeping forth even beneath the February snow. No one having previously heard his history could for the first time behold Father Mapple without the utmost interest, because there were certain engrafted clerical peculiarities about him, imputable to the adventurous maritime life he had led. When he entered, I observed that he carried no umbrella, and certainly had not come in his carriage, for his tarpaulin had hat ran down with the melting sleep and his great pilot cloth jacket seemed almost to drag him to the floor with the weight of the water it had absorbed. However, hat, coat, and overshoes were one by one removed and hung up in a little space in an adjacent corner, when, arrayed in a decent suit, he quietly approached his, the pulpit. Like most old-fashioned pulpits, it was a very lofty one, and since irregular stairs to such a height would, by its long angle with the floor, seriously contract the already small area of the chapel, the architect, it seemed, had acted upon the hint of Father Mapple and finished the pulpit without a stairs, substituting a perpendicular side ladder like those used in mounting a ship from a boat at sea. The wife of a whaling captain had provided the chapel with a handsome pair of red worsted man ropes for this ladder which, being itself nicely headed and stained with a mahogany color, the whole contrivance, considering what man old chapel it was, seemed by no means in bad taste. Halting for an instant at the foot of the ladder, and with both hands grasping the ornamental knobs of the man ropes, Father Mapple cast a look upwards, and then, with a truly sailor-like but still reverential dexterity, hand over hand, mounted the ropes as if, as if ascending the main top of his vessel. The perpendicular parts of this side ladder, as is usually the case with swinging ones, were of cloth-covered rope. Only the rounds were of wood, so that at every step there was a joint. At my first glimpse of the pulpit, it had not escaped me that, however convenient for a ship, these joints in the present instance seemed unnecessary. For I was not prepared to see Father Mapple, after gaining the height, slowly turn round, stooping over the pulpit, deliberately drag up the ladder step by step, till the hole was deposited within, leaving him impregnable in his little Quebec. I pondered some time without fully comprehending the reason for this. Father Mapple enjoyed such a wide reputation for sincerity and sanctity that I could not suspect him of courting notoriety by any mere tricks of this stage. No, thought I, there must be some sober reason for this thing. Furthermore, it must symbolize something unseen. Can it be, then, that by that act of physical isolation, he signifies his spiritual withdrawal for the time, from all outward worldly ties and connections? Yes, for a replenished with the meat and wine of the world, to the faithful man of God, this pulpit, I see, as a self-containing stronghold, a lofty Aaron Breitstein, with a perennial well of water within the walls. But the side ladder was not the only strange feature of the place. Borrowed from the chaplain's former seafarings, between the marble cenotaphs on either hand of the pulpit, the wall with which formed its back was adorned with a large painting representing a gallant ship 
speeding against a terrible storm off of a lee coast of black rocks and snowy breakers. But high above the flying scud, dark rolling clouds, there floated a little isle of sunlight from which beamed forth an angel's face. In this bright face shed a dis distinct spot of radiance upon the ship's tossed deck. Something like that silver plate now inserted into the victory's plank where Nelson fell. Ah, noble ship, the angel seemed to say, Beat on, beat on, thou noble ship, and bear a hardy helm. For lo, the sun is breaking through, the clouds are rolling off, the Rhenus d'Azur is at hand. Nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of the same sea taste that had achieved the latter in the picture. Its paneled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested on a projecting piece of scroll work fashioned after a ship's fiddlehead beak. What could be more full of meaning? For the pulpit is ever the earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first described. And the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is the god of breezes fair or foul is first invoked upon for favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prize. That is the end of chapter 9, chapter 8. That is the end of chapter 8.